We are in uh, 1 Timothy. Paul wrote <clears throat> two letters to Timothy. Who's Timothy? He is a young pastor serving in the city of Ephesus. In this first of two letters that Paul wrote to Timothy, also called epistles, Paul arrest, uh, addresses some areas including dealing with false teachers. He talks in chapter 2 about the priority of prayer. He goes on and talks about the role of women in the church, qualifications for leaders in the church, deacons, elders, instructions on caring for widows and slaves. And then in chapter 6, earlier than what Alex read, Paul talks about the dangers of materialism. Today's text marks the closing of this first letter. So what was on Paul's mind as he penned these final words? It can be best summed up with the words of verse 12. Fight the good fight of or for the faith. Today and tomorrow we observe Veterans Day and we pay respect to the men and women who have served in our nation's armed forces. When I was a young boy, we used to sing a song in children's church. It was called, I'm in the Lord's Army. Some of you may remember it. If I sang it, you still wouldn't remember it. You wouldn't recognize the way I sang it. I remember in ninth grade, we had to sign up for a uh, class, like an extra class, or we got study hall, but you couldn't just offer study hall. You had to try out for something. So I tried out for chorus. I got all my friends to try out too, and um, the choir director said, I'm going to play some notes of the first few notes of the Star Spangled Banner. I want you to sing them. She, after I was done, she said, I haven't heard it quite like that. <laughs> and then she said, uh, I'll post the names of everybody that made the choir. I didn't need to go look at the names. I knew I didn't make it. I'm still scarred from that. But that song, I'm in the Lord's Army. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18, Paul encouraged young pastor Timothy to stand in such a way that he could fight the good fight. In both the beginning and the ending of this letter, this epistle, the apostle reminds Timothy that as a child of God, Timothy, you are engaged in spiritual warfare. Like Timothy, you and I must be aware that we're in an all-out battle for our faith and for the Christian faith, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we profess to be followers of Christ, then we're involved in spiritual warfare whether we acknowledge it, whether we recognize it or not. And this truth of spiritual warfare is taught throughout the pages of Scripture. You see some references in your bulletin. Hebrews 12, 4 says, we wage war against sin. 1 Peter 2, 11 says, sinful desires constantly wage war against our souls. In the book of Jude, the letter of Jude, chapter, or verse 3, Jude challenges us to contend or to fight for the faith. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, we're told that we are soldiers enlisted in the Lord's army. And then Paul also wrote a letter to the church at Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 7, and 10, 4, mentioned that we have some weapons as the believer. And finally, probably most familiar to us is Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 8, it mentions our spiritual battle. And know this. Our spiritual battle is not against people as much as it is against Satan and his evil kingdom. And Paul talks in that chapter uh, 6 of Ephesians about the spiritual armor that we should put on, the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of uh, salvation and the shield of faith. And we need to put those on on a daily basis. Here's the reality. Every... Believer in Jesus Christ is engaged in spiritual warfare. His or her faith may and will be attacked in a variety of ways. Sometimes the battleground is for our marriage. Sometimes the battlefield is a parent-child battle. For men, it's often a battle for purity. Earlier in 1 Timothy 6, Paul addresses the need for God's people to address the prevailing pursuit of materialism, of accumulating possessions. And of course, 
most of us, if we'll be honest, could testify of the tremendous battle that we face on a daily basis with doubt or unbelief. Most of you, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, should have figured out this. The Christian life is not a bed of roses. Nowhere in Scriptures is suggested that we'll be on easy street, that life will always be smooth sailing. The fact is, this spiritual struggle is also against unbelievers. Satan declares war on every human being. And Satan is called the thief in John 10 by Jesus. And Jesus said he's come to kill and to steal and to destroy. Satan's end goal was this, to take as many people down with him as possible. He knows he's doomed. He knows he's defeated. And he wants to take as many people down with him as he can. There's a fierce battle being waged for the souls of men and women. And Paul, Paul says, we're in this battle. Listen to me. Don't take this battle lightly. Satan, our enemy, is the most formidable foe. The leader of the Reformation, Martin Luther, wrote a beautiful hymn called A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And in that he talks about Satan and he said concerning Satan, on earth is not his equal. Satan's intention is to do this, to discredit, to downplay, to deny God's glory, to distort the gospel of Christ and to destroy people specifically God's people. Listen carefully. Satan wants to ruin your marriage. He wants to destroy your relationships, break up your family. He wants to ruin your pural, purity, your moral integrity. And at all costs, Satan wants to keep you from knowing the glory of God and from spreading the good news of Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And if you're trying to walk after Jesus, he's going to do all that he can to come after you. Peter described Satan as a roaring lion who walks around seeking whom he may devour. He's looking at you and saying, where's the weak part of your life? Where can I attack you? Where can I tempt you? Now, Satan is powerful, but he's not all powerful. And know this, though, in your own strength, you are no match for him. He's no laughing matter. People picture Satan and they laugh about him, the devil. They think he's funny. He's no laughing matter. And we must be careful not to underestimate him. In addition to understanding, being aware that our enemy is formidable, we must be mindful of this. The spiritual war warfare we're talking about is universal in scope. It is a global battle. That means this. It's inescapable. You just can't run away from it. You don't get to choose whether or not you're going to be involved in this spiritual battle. Your involvement began the day that you were born into the human race. You can't just ignore it and hope that it will go away. But I want to point out what James said in James chapter 4, verse 7. Here's what he said. Submit to God, then resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And the order is important. And I want to say, we need to submit to God first. But notice, he didn't say just ignore the devil. He said resist him. But only after you first submit or surrender to God. Because if you simply try to ignore this spiritual warfare, or you pretend, oh, there's no battle, there's no struggle to be had, you will not stand. And you can see on your handout in the bulletin, spiritual retreat leads to spiritual defeat. And... Keep this in mind. The stakes in this spiritual battle are eternal. You think losing an arm or a leg or an eye is traumatic? It is. In this spiritual battle, being a casualty means losing everything. Your own soul. Now keep this in mind. There is a God over this world who wants all men to be saved. 1 Peter or 1 Timothy 2 4, you're in that chapter, you can read it. God desires that all be saved. But there's also a small g, God in this world, who wants all people to join him for an eternity in the lake of fire. 
There's an all-out battle for the souls of your family and for your friends that you hang out with and your neighbors that you live alongside and your co-workers and your classmates and your teammates. There's an all-out battle for their souls. How you and I go about fighting this battle has eternal implications. Satan doesn't want us to believe. He doesn't want us to live out. He doesn't want us to spread this gospel. In light of the battle that's waging all around us, Paul instructs us in verse 12 to fight the good fight of or for the faith. It is indeed the good fight. And we have already stated that it is for eternal life. It's a fight for peace and confidence and hope, not just for you, but for all others. It's a good fight, but it's certainly not an easy fight. Many of you know this. I like to work out. People say, how do you handle the stress of ministry? If you don't know what stress of ministry is, come see me. I'll tell you. But just recently, I like to work out. And just recently, I said, you know, I need to do more than cardio. I want to lift weights lightly. Now, up there, there's the grunt-free zone at Planet Fitness. And so you're not supposed to go in there and act like you're the Hulkster. But I see some people, and I'm going, man, I don't know how they button their shirts. they got so many muscles. I don't even know if they can move their arms to do that. I'm not like that. I'm over there in the weak boy section <laughs> on the universals, and I'm looking at the weights. And when I'm done, I just move the peg down, make everybody think, wow, that guy was... <laughs> I learned some tricks up there. But there are those days when it's hard to go to Planet Fitness. Whoever put a gallery up there or those stores up there at the wind capital of the world, you come out there in the winter after you're sweating, and it is brutally cold. And sometimes I'm like, I think I'll just skip it. But when I'm done, it feels good. I need it physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. And the benefits of getting in and keeping in shape require effort, sometimes painful effort. Sometimes, Sandy, go, those people are looking at you like, are you okay? You're all red and you're wet. And it's like I was running one time by the middle school, and I got done running. I was stretching on the sidewalk, and two cars stopped and said, hey, mister, you all right? Do we need to call somebody? Yeah, I'm okay. Other people said, I see you running, and you look like you're in pain. There's a reason why I look that way, because I am in pain. <laughs> they don't ask me if I want to ride, but <laughs> our spiritual life is a lot like that. It's not an easy fight, but it's a good fight. And the reward which God has secured and guaranteed for us is more than worth the effort to keep on fighting. Now think about for you as an individual, where is the battle raging in your life? It may be different for each one of us. Some of you, the battle's for your marriage. It's struggling. Or your parenting. Or some other relationship. Or your work environment. Or your emotions. Be encouraged from today's Scripture passage to keep on. Allow the Word of God and the Spirit of God to strengthen you. There's a future day, and I can't wait for it, when the battle will cease and peace will reign. But we're not there yet. So for now, Paul informs us we must fight. And he begins with the admonition in verse 11. Flee from evil that pulls you from God. In this situation, we fight by fleeing. It may sound like we're running away from a fight instead of actually engaging. But let me remind you this. Sometimes running is the best way to avoid defeat. Imagine that I would meet a 300-pound man on the street, a football player on the street, who wants to crush me. Well, hand-to-hand -hand combat isn't wise. Running is. I said earlier it may be dangerous to ignore the reality of the battle. Think about it. If I pretend this guy that's coming toward me, 300-pound football player, is coming toward me, and I pretend, oh, I don't see him. He's not coming. It's not helpful. He's going to crush me. Running is not denying warfare. It's one strategy within warfare. Paul said we should run or flee from all this. And you say, well, what did he mean by all this? Look at verses 3 to 10. Probably things that he's talked about there. Flee materialism, quarreling, fighting, slander, and arrogance. And let me suggest to you three ways that we should run from evil. 
First, run from sinful actions. I want to make it perfectly clear. Run from every temptation to sin. Don't dilly-dally around. Don't toy with sin. Don't flirt with sin. Don't say to yourself, well, I just want to see how close I can get to it without engaging or participating or getting burnt. Whatever your struggle is, you know what it is. If you have trouble with porn, don't say, well, I'm going to get on the website and just click and see how fast I can click off. If you have trouble with alcohol, don't say, well, I'm just going to go to the bar and see how long I can resist before I engage. If you have trouble with something else in your life, don't see how much you can flirt with it before you get burned. And beware this. Sin usually starts subtly, and it appears to be harmless. And remember, what tempts you might not tempt me. You, I might tell you what tempts me, and you go, oh, that's ridiculous. That's, how could you struggle with that? And then you tell me what you struggle with, and I might say, Satan puts, he walks around like that roaring lion, knowing, looking where our chink in our armor is, and, and then he puts it in this little neat package, and he doesn't tell you if you open it and engage and participate in it, you're going to have some dire consequences. He doesn't do that. He is a deceiver. He is the liar. And it often starts with just a glance or a seamless hug, or a harmless kiss, or some seemingly minor purchase. Listen very carefully. Don't flirt with danger. I've had groups of men meet and say, you know what, Pastor? That's exactly what I did. I flirted with that danger, and I got so messed up and paid a steep price for it. Get out of there. And run as fast and far as you possibly can. Head in the opposite direction. Remove yourself from the temptation. Don't open the door even the slightest crack. Second, run from sinful desires. In verses 9 and 10, Paul writes about sinful desires such as the thirst for riches and the love of money. Those are the cravings which, if fed, will serve to pull you away from the Lord. Third, run from sinful thoughts. This is the good fight of faith. We are instructed, believe, trust God. We need to commit to taking God at His word. Why is it that we seem so intent in chasing worldly possessions, earthly things? Because, quite frankly, we don't believe the words of the song we sang. More than enough. All of you is more than enough for me. We don't believe that, so we say, there has to be something else. No, you satisfy me. You take care of my every thirst. Paul encourages us to combat the desire for stuff with the belief that God is more than enough for us. At the core of our spiritual struggle with sin are struggles to believe and trust God. Now think about it. Why do you lie? Because you actually believe, well, it'll be better for me if I lie than if I tell the truth. It'll be better for me if I disregard and disobey one of the Ten Commandments that says, thou shalt not bear false witness or lie. Why do we give in to sexual impurity? Because you don't really believe that purity is the best way to go. You don't believe that God's plans are the best in this area of your life. Why do we wrestle with doubt and fear? Because we're not 100% confident that God will take care of us as He promised through His Word. We're hesitant to believe that His promises are true and good. So we give in to doubt and unbelief. Child of God, the Bible is your weapon in this fight for faith. As I said, run from sinful actions, sinful desires, sinful thoughts. But don't just run from something. No, no, run to something. In verse 11, Paul challenges us to run to or pursue six things. Righteousness, uh, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. So what's righteousness? That refers to righteous thinking and living. Godliness refers to godly belief and behavior. And keep this in mind. Belief dictates behavior. What you really believe is going to be shown, evidenced, demonstrated in your behavior. Faith, that seeks a deeper trust in God. He is trustworthy. There's the saying, frog, fully rely on God. Love, seek an even greater affection for God. 
Let me ask you, when's the last time that you stopped and appropriately considered the depth and breadth of God's love for you? When is that last time that you thought of God's love for you? Endurance is a call to keep on in the midst of difficult circumstances. We press on, even though things and times are tough, and it seems like, wow, where is the end of this? It just keeps on going. But no, we endure. And gentleness can be defined as kindness toward difficult people. So let me ask you, do you know any difficult people? Because if you don't, I'll introduce you to some. Now, listen to me very, they're not here, and they don't attend this church. We don't have any of that here. Yes, we must have strength, but it's strength under control, not out of control. And let me point out that we don't get any of those six things by self-effort alone. All six have been purchased by Christ. And it's only as we walk in harmony and obedience to Christ that these things which we are to pursue become a reality in our life. Paul wrote to the church at Philippi in Philippians 1, 6, and he said, the one who began a good work in you will continue to the day that he calls you home. If you are a Christian, that's when he began his good work, when he saved you. And he's going to continue to work in your life. He's the potter, we're the clay. We have to let him do that work. 2 Peter 1, 3 says, God's given us everything we need to live a godly life. So you're the only one that can sum up, am I living a godly life? But if you're not, you can't say, God, you haven't equipped me. He's given us everything we need. It's at our disposal. It's at our beckoning. But we need to plug it in. Look at 1 Timothy 6, 12. Eternal life is freely given. God's called us to it. But we must fight to take hold of it, to embrace it by faith. What Paul was encouraging Timothy and all believers is to experience the life that Jesus Christ has given you. He said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. A life, a full life, a joyful life. We have life through faith in Christ. But the reality is we often struggle and almost on a daily basis to experience the fullness of this supernatural life. And I want to say I am convinced that too many Christians are not experiencing the life that Jesus died to give you. They're settling for mediocrity. And they say, this is just the norm. Listen, what you think is the norm is far below what Jesus wants for you. And until Christ calls us home, we must continue in this daily battle to experience the life he purchased for us when he gave his life on the cross. Maybe you, like many others, feel, well, you know what, Pastor? I've tried it. And this battle in the Christian life, it's too demanding. Paul offers a number of exhortations or encouragements. If you're a, one, if you're a Christian, the wonderful truth is this. God has called your name. He calls you by name. You're his child. You, we sang, you're not fighting against God. He's with you. I'm not against you. I am for you. You have confessed your faith. You have taken your stand with the Lord Jesus. And if you've been baptized, that is a powerful demonstration of your willingness to identify yourself as a follower of Jesus Christ. The Lord willing, next week there will be several that are getting baptized. If you've not yet been baptized since you gave your life to Christ, it's a great opportunity. There's still time. You can sign up. You can call me this week, and we would love to baptize you. You can tell others, and this is the message you declare. My life is in Jesus. I consider myself dead to sin, and I've been raised to a new life. I want to walk after Christ. You can also, verse 13, be encouraged to know that you live in light of God's presence. Practice His presence. He is always with you. He said, I'll never leave you, never forsake you. You can live in view of Christ's faithfulness. When Jesus' life was on the line as he stood before Pontius Pilate, Paul says he made the good confession. He confessed his kingship. Pilate said, are you the king? He says, it's as you said. And it cost him Jesus his life. Jesus Christ is the Savior who died for you. He stands beside you in the battle. The God of angel armies is always by my side. 
Jesus Christ, verse 14, is the king who is coming back for you. And we're admonished to walk in obedience until Jesus returns. We fight with our eyes fixed on the sky. We look for, we long for the appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul talked about that when he wrote a letter to Titus. And he said, the grace of God has appeared to you, teaching you to say no to ungodliness while we wait for the blessed hope of our coming Savior. We pursue godliness because we understand that Jesus Christ is coming back. And listen, He's coming for the faithful, not the faithless. We live in awe, verse 15 and 16, of awe, awe of God's greatness. There's a lot of songs that talk about God's greatness. These verses, 15 and 16, comprise one of the most majestic, glorious hymns of praise to God. Notice what Paul says about God in verse 15 and 16. He says His rule is universal. He is sovereign over everything. His reign is invincible. He is the unmatchable King of kings. He is immortal. He is beyond time, from everlasting to everlasting. Thou art God, Psalm 92. He is unapproachable. We can't even approach Him in His holiness and light, in His glory. Moses said, Lord, show me your glory. And God said, nobody can see my glory and live. He is inconceivable. No one can completely understand God. He's so great. Psalm 145.3, His greatness no one can fathom. He is omnipotent. He has all power. And He alone deserves praise. To God alone bring Glory and honor. In verses 17 and 19, Paul returns to the issue of materialism. He's already addressed it in verses 5 to 10. So why does he go back to this subject? Paul's been teaching that contentment comes with godliness, and it's something that we must fight for. And one way we can do this, you might not like, give away what we have. In comparison to the rest of the world, most of us are wealthy. Paul urges, he says, give for eternal gain. So how do we give for eternal gain? By fleeing certain things. Flee self-confidence. Verse 17, don't be arrogant. Don't put your confidence in your possessions. Possessions can often produce pride. We like to tell ourselves, well, you know what? My security is not in my possessions. But the minute we start thinking about giving them away, we get a little insecure. Oh, I'm, I'm thinking about giving my money to somebody. I'm thinking about giving this possession. And then we start wrestling with it. No, I don't know if I really want to do that. Flee self-confidence. Flee self-centeredness. Riches can ho- cause you to put your hope in yourself. Like Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 4, I built this great kingdom. We can say, well, look what I did. Look at my house. Look at my car. Look at my financial portfolio. We can look at what we've achieved, what we've accomplished what we've attained and begin to feel smug. Move on to verses 17 to 19. Paul says, put your hope in God. He has graciously provided us with all things to enjoy. Things in and of themselves are not inherently evil. In fact, things were created by God to be enjoyed as His good gift to us. We should in turn, verse 18, use those gifts for the good of others. If you seek to be rich, let it be rich in giving. We are to, Jesus said, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Invest in the eternity of others. We should not hoard but give, not indulge but sacrifice. In verses 20 and 21, Paul brings his charge to Timothy to a close. As one who's serving the church at Ephesus, Timothy was instructed to guard all spiritual truth. Paul poured his life into Timothy, giving him spiritual truth. He mentored Timothy. Paul shared the good news of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And these and other foundational truths were under attack in first century Ephesus. And guess what? These foundational truths are also under attack in 21st century America. We, like Timothy, must be faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You say, well, why is it so important to hold on to the gospel and not waver? First, for our sake. 
We must remain in the truth. Paul talked, as you read in this letter, about those who had wandered from the faith. Don't ever think that you're above that, that you can't stumble in trying to hold on to the truth. All across the American landscape are people whose lives have been wrecked because they abandoned the faith they once professed to believe in. There were people going to churches and gung-ho for Jesus and going forward and vocal in their faith and visible in their faith, and now they're nowhere to be found when it comes to Christianity. Second, we must hold fast to the gospel of Christ for the sake of others, for those outside the church. We must preach and teach the gospel with the hope of seeing these people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. Remember, eternity is at stake. For those inside the church, clinging to the truth is essential. If we lose our way here at West Hills Community Church, what will happen is we will become like many other churches in our day. Churches that no longer see people saved. No longer see people baptized. No longer see people growing. Listen, there are churches in this town that used to be soul winning churches. And people were getting baptized and people were growing. And those churches are a shell or they're closed. Churches across Europe and the United States once preached the good news of Jesus Christ. But they're not doing that today. They've lost their way, and they no longer bring glory to God. And I remember my dad saying across some churches it could be written, Ichabod, the glory of the Lord has departed. He left the church a long time ago, and people don't even know he left. Too many churches want preachers that want want their pastor to preach, hey, feel good sermons. Listen, sometimes people go, man, he's passionate. He's serious. The stakes are eternal. I'm going to be passionate. You're going to stand before Jesus someday, and I want him to say, welcome home. Enter into the joy, the reward of your labor. If pastors reject the authority of Scripture or they depart from the truth of the gospel, that pastor should be removed from the church. Now, if all this talk about fighting as you're feeling weak, there's good news. Look at Paul's closing words. Grace be with all of you. Paul understood, Timothy, you can't do it on your own, and neither can we. Ministry's hard work. I was talking to some between service, and ministry's hard. Sometimes people say, what other job do you have? What do you do the other six days of the week? I sit at my desk and pray that the phone rings and I have something to do. Ministry's hard. Paul strived, but God was the one who provided the strength. It's reassuring to know we're never alone in this fierce battle. God is with us, and so are other believers. About a year and a half ago, there was a big thing going on about diversity and uh, Islamic being taught in the public school, and I stood up for the Lord and our church and our young people, and I took a beating on social media. And it was wearisome. I want people to like me. And people were saying stuff that wasn't true. They never met me, never talked to me, but they knew everything. Never called me to say, is this true? What do you think? What are you doing? Let me hear what you have to say. And I remember being right here in this worship center. And I was having a meeting later that day. And I was reading this passage. Keep fighting the good fight. And I remember weeping profusely going, Lord, I'm trying to fight the good fight. But quite frankly, I'm weary. I'm tired. I'm hurt. I'm about ready to give up, and I, and I sobbed, and I prayed to him. And there's a song called Keep Fighting the Good Fight, and I played it. And then the Lord in his sovereignty had a, a small group of women meeting that day, and they knew what was going on. They came in and prayed with me. It was a beautiful thing. Ministry is hard. Serving Christ is hard. Paul had the entire church in mind at Ephesus. The word you is plural there. God is with us, and we're never alone in the fight of faith. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, be encouraged. We don't fight this war for victory. We fight from victory. We are on the victor's side. We need to live like victors. Our ultimate triumph is assured because Jesus Christ has conquered sin and death. Listen, the way you go about your Christian life impacts others for eternity. 
What if somebody picked you out and said, I'm going to watch you for a while and see how serious you are about Jesus. And if you're in church and if you read your Bible and how you go about work and how you treat your spouse and how you treat your kids or as a kid, how you respect your parents, how you listen to your parents and how you conduct yourself in the neighborhood. We're in the victor's side. If you haven't been baptized Next Sunday is a great opportunity. There's a sign-up in the bulletin on the tearaway part. You can put it in the uh, popcorn bucket. Um, some of you don't even know we have a popcorn bucket. You've been coming a long time and say, wow, this is great. Never have to put anything in the offering. I don't know who puts in. There's a bucket that we started at the theater. We're never going to pass it. That's just the way God's provided. Uh, and I don't have to say, go put your money in there. I don't even care what you put in there between you and the Lord. Let's pray. So our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Do you know the Christ we've been talking about? Have you begun eternal life with Him? If you're not sure today, you can be sure by praying a prayer similar to this in the quietness of your own heart. Dear Lord Jesus, today I admit I agree I am a sinner. And I know that you died on the cross for my sins. You gave your life and shed your blood to pay for my sin. I am sorry for my sin. I ask you to forgive me, to cleanse me. And I'm opening my heart and my life and asking you to come in to be my Savior today. And I want to follow you as the ruler, the Lord of my life from this moment on. So our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. If you prayed that prayer today, just ask you to slip your up. No one's going to point you out in any fashion. Say, Pastor, today I prayed I asked Jesus into my life. Perhaps there are those who say, you know, I am a Christian and I want to be part of that. I want to fight the good fight. I want to keep on fighting it. Would you pray for me that I might be faithful in that? Yes, are there any others? Lots of hands. Father, I thank you for your love for us. And I thank you we're on the victor's side. Help us to live that way. And help us to be surrendered to you on a daily basis. Lord, I just pray that you continue to move in this congregation to us individually and corporately. In Jesus' name, amen. you are